And I was listening to Sean uh, this morning uh, talk about his problems getting hold of Chris Luxon uh, to um, discuss uh, things on this program. I don't know what the problem is um, with the National Party right at the moment on not having um, Luxon come up and talk to Sean, or even me for that matter. Um, I haven't asked, to be fair, but... I, I really honestly think that it's time for the National Party to rethink whatever policy they have in place for Chris not talking to Sean. Uh, the platform has become a thing, as they say these days, a real thing. And if you have a look at the number of subscribers, they're doubling um, very quickly. And the number of views on some of the podcasts across various um, platforms uh, in, in social media uh, are getting to some really big, like, big numbers. So this is a, now a very, well, it always has been in my books, but it's a very credible media platform. And Sean is still, to my mind, one of the best interviewers in this country, bar none. And so I implore my national mates to change your policy and get Chris to, to front up and have a decent conversation with Sean. He's not that scary. Seriously, he's a big wuss when you know him. Uh, um, but, you know, you, you, you're, losing, you're losing face by not putting your leader up on this program. Now, we know Chris Hipkins has been interviewed by the platform in the past. I would expect him to be interviewed in the future. Kieran McNulty has been interviewed on the platform in the past. And he will be interviewed in the future. So this time has come to change your views on this media outlet, which has gained a head of steam in the last few months. And I'm really proud to be part of it. Uh, so that's my, that's my request today of my friends in the National Party. And up on uh, next, I have economist Robert McCulloch. Good morning, Robert. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Slight technical glitch there. Um, 62 years of age and sometimes I just forget the wrong button. Uh, we've got Robert McCulloch, economist online. Good morning, Robert. Good morning, good morning. <laughs> um, were you listening to some of the conversation? Could you hear some of that while you were online waiting? Yes, I could. I could hear it all. And I think it's fantastic to have the platform. It's an extremely important part of the debate. Yeah. And uh, it's great. Yeah. yeah. So he needs, a, he needs a bloody kick, a smack around the ears, as my grandmother would say. He needs a clip around the ears. <laughs> mm. <laughs> Get him yes. to front up. Um, yeah, so yeah. Robert, look, look um, I, there was a column that you've written just recently in the last few days, which I could not find mm. this morning. Um, mm. Can you just give us a bit of an outline around, around that? Well, it was arguing that there's a tremendous amount of branding going on in the parties. And uh, after all, you know, uh, Adurn had her background in communications. Mm. Uh, Luxon is a former brand manager. Hipkins has been a policy wonk, politician most of his life. There's a lot of branding, but if you look underneath the brands at what's actually different in their products, at least when it comes to economic policies, yeah. uh, I struggle to find a, a great deal of fundamental differences between national and Labor's economic policies. And the article was looking at the National Party's five-point plan. And if you go through every one of those points, there's not a lot of difference between uh, what Labor is offering and what National is offering. So that was the theme of the article. Yeah, and, and so so what you're saying basically is, is, is like, we've got two parties that are virtually the same with different people, and it's around credibility yep. of leadership that will define yes, the, exactly. the election. And the leaders have become actors. So the article ended by saying, look, it's like a Hollywood movie production. Uh, the leaders are not producers. They're not coming up with the idea of the movie. They're not writers. But they just want an actor to play lead role. And whoever the actor is, the plot's the same. Uh, you know, it's been done by other people. And, you know, does Brad Pitt get the job or does George Clooney get the job? Uh, and, and they're competing along those kinds of lines. Yeah. Um, that's that's what, the, what, that, what that article was about, which I, which I genuinely uh, I believe. So if you, if you take, for example, and that's say they'll reduce size of government, cut wasteful spending, 
Uh, well, the, the primary spending uh, pressure in this country, for example, is health care. And the Treasury have these long-term fiscal forecasts which show our debt going to 100% of GDP by 2048. That's mainly driven by health care. Well, that mm. forecast is identical under national or labour. National have no plans uh, to make our health system work more efficiently. It's not working uh, efficiently now. No, it's not. And they yeah. don't have a plan to, 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 to change that. So, uh, And then when you move to tax policy, uh, they're running on the same corporate tax rate. They're running on the same personal tax rate now because Luxon wobbled on you know, cutting the top tax rate. Yeah. And they're running on the same rate of GST. So, you know, can they please tell us uh, exactly what the problem is? Look, I'm, I'm uh, work at the university, so often academics are labelled quite sort of left-wing or whatever. I find myself far to the right of national on yeah. economic policy. Yep. So when it comes to healthcare, I did a proposal a few years ago with Sir Roger Douglas on how to reform our health system more along the lines of Singapore, uh, have a lot greater private provision. And the National Party rejected that. They're not interested. Well, if they're not interested in more, you know, private supply of welfare services, I thought that was a hallmark of more pro-market parties. So I want to know what they stand for. Is, is, the, is the reluctance to move into that private market because we're bloody useless, or governments are, are really useless around uh, managing contracts for private suppliers? Um, and I've, I mean, I've been in and out of government over the years, mm -hmm. and and we're mm -hmm. not good at the procurement stuff, and we're sure we're surely not very good at managing contracts, um, and uh, we mm -hmm. see it every now and again with uh, various failures, a and so we, you know, you've had, we've had that um, private prison stuff in the past as well, which was you know turned to custard a bit, mm -hmm. um, and and it's more uh, to me, and and interested in your thoughts on this. Is it really because governments are pretty useless at this stuff? And how do you get over um, that? How does well, there are ways, well, there are ways around it, which is to uh, get the government out, out of that business. And, uh, for example, in Singapore, uh, look, uh, over half, the majority of suppliers are private, but even in what are regarded as quite socialist countries like France, uh, 30 to 40 percent of their hospitals are private. In Canada, mm. it's the vast majority. And there are ways around the problem that, that you're describing. Uh, people, it's a universal healthcare system. People, uh, the bills are paid for by uh, your social insurance scheme. And you hand choice back to the patient, to the customer. So you decide where to go. You could go private, you could go public. The bill will be paid yeah. uh, by the insurance company. So the procurement is done by really you and your GP. Right. You decide where to go and you purchase the, the, those uh, services from your desired uh, supplier. So if you're and a really poor person and you don't have so any money, you're going to get the same provision? You, you do. Uh, regardless of your income, uh, you can choose where to go and uh, y your bill will be paid for. So it's a mm -hmm. wonderful thing. You can be a low, low income. It's universal health care. So there are mechanisms now that have been designed where everyone can go. It's not just something for the rich. Low income folks have the choice. They can go to a private supplier. Their bill will be paid because there will be social insurance for everyone. And I think there's great confusion about that, that sort of more private supply means it's only for the rich. There are, you know, economics has moved on. There are ways around that. But yep. I think the Nats are terrified of being labelled pro-privatisation of healthcare. It's got, it's got nothing to do with that. Well, what we're doing at the moment is not working. And, uh, you know, the, uh, the other thing is uh, uh, there was a, a little press release that came out just before Christmas from a thing called the Trends Analysis Network, which is mm -hmm. basically a bunch of boffins who work out mm -hmm. algorithms to see if they can extract and make sense of data. And one of the things mm -hmm. that I picked up on was um, government is putting lots of money into trying to employ and hire um, people mm -hmm. in the health sector uh, with little effect. Uh, but mm -hmm. they're not putting much effort, but uh, a lot of money into hiring people at the back end in policy. <laughs> mm. And they're doing okay. Um, mm. and, and, and so we're not putting the resources in the right places. So how do we overcome that? Well, if you take a look at Singapore, for example, they have high quality health care at around half the cost 
of uh, of New Zealand. So half the cost, they're running it twice as more uh, efficiently. And, you know, they've moved away from this heavily centralised system with tonnes of bureaucrats and administrators that, that, you're, that you're describing. Mm. Um, you know, you, you, it's you and your GP decide where to go. There's a private hospital. Uh, you go there. Uh, regardless of your income, and the bill is paid by social insurance. And so, so you, don't yeah. worry about the bill; it'll be picked up, and you don't have this, you know, centralised, massive health authority. So you would have thought it's a single biggest item of government spending. Mm. And where is the Nats plan on it? Well, you know that that that's I think, you know, what 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 has a, a become a weakness in the National Party. I'd, I'd query whether they're a genuine right wing party anymore. And so I haven't had a look at them manifestos of the various parties but where does ACT sit on the issue? Well uh, ACT are uh, uh, not that different from well, the Well that's NAT. a bit of a they're, bloody they're, worry <laughs> Yeah they're, they're promoting uh, more uh, private outsourcing mm. uh, as you described but they're not promoting a fundamental change in the system like a move to Singapore they've also rejected that so this is an issue we've got in Kiwi politics you've got the parties on the right but you know when it comes to their welfare policies uh, not just on health care on uh, also pensions. Uh, I think ACT are much better on education than the Nats because yes. ACT are, uh, and David Seymour has been a champion of charter schools mm. and that's sort of a model of uh, private provision but, but public public funding and yep. I think they charter schools were a wonderful opportunity for Māori and Pacifica to, you know, it, it promotes autonomy and self-governance but also, it, you know, it's funded and in the United States, uh, President President Obama was a huge fan of charter schools to help black American children yeah. with more opportunities. So ACT have been, in that sense, uh, are to the right of national when but it comes interesting to... interesting enough, a lot of Māori are actually into charter schools too. They get it. Um, very but it's very much, very never, much. Never, yeah. never managed to get it across the line because it's just seen as something they don't understand. The other thing is I wonder but, with all of these really seriously big institutional changes that we need to make around health yeah. and welfare and stuff like that, mm -hmm. is, is it we get a government in for three years, they, they sort their shit out for the first year and then they do some stuff in the next year and then they start getting ready for the election. So the election mm -hmm. cycle's too short to really do mm -hmm. any transformative transformative change um, that you're mm. talking about. And I, I can't see a way through that when you only have a three-year cycle. Is there mm. any solutions that you can see around getting getting our pol political parties to be a lot braver? Because we saw Labor probably being a little bit brave around three waters and look where that took them. Yes. Um, well, I, I have share a similar concern. Um, there seems to be a shift at the moment because both parties want to uh, avoid uh, being associated with a recession and want to get economic growth back. And it seems that even Hipkins yesterday is being tempted because business are for opening up immigration way more. And there seems... Uh, you know, it, it could well happen. It seems that the Nats are, are very much pro, uh, probably going back to the key years in terms of very high immigration rates and Labor's been tempted by the same policy and that's in a way an easy way to get uh, GDP going up again. But it's a very short-term policy in the sense that mm. uh, going back to those years of 70,000, 80,000 net immigration to the country, it's, it, it produced all these long-term pressures on infrastructure, on our health system, on our schools. And I think, I think the immigration is a very good example of that. Uh, the three drivers of growth during the key years were, were immigration, construction and tourism. Mm. It wasn't so much looking like, you know, it wasn't productivity improvements and it wasn't homegrown, if you like, economic yeah. growth. Yeah. Uh, so I worry that there's a short-termism, especially around that immigration issue. Yes, Yes, and I, I, I mean, we're in the wider upper and uh, we're seeing it all around us, really, with the lack of workers in some key industries um, at the moment, mm. too. Um, but th there doesn't seem to be any pipeline in the education system to address some of the shortages either. Uh, so there's no sort of I, coherent big strategy. No, that would be, to me, Labor's chief failing that they're trying to somewhat cover up at the moment that they 
they had the closed border policy, that was all fine, but you to deal with the virus, but um, they had to respond in education and in skills and in training. They'll talk the talk, they did things, but uh, they've left the country woefully short of, mm. of skills. And so they've got this problem. They, they did not spend their five years in office really increasing the local, the domestic capability to do all these jobs. Yeah. That, that's a, a, a huge failing of Grant Robertson and Adern and Hipkins, because Hipkins was, you know, minister for, I think, tertiary education. So they, um, they failed on the education front. Now business doesn't have the skills and now they, they just want to get immigrant immigration going again because there's a shortage. Yeah, that's right. And I mean, it's really interesting because I've always admired some of the work that the Productivity Commission did under Murray Sherwin's mm. watch. Um, yeah, it's, it hasn't hasn't been quite so good under Ganesh Nana, is it? Yeah, I think that's the, the new the new head of the Productivity Commission. Um, it hasn't been the same because I think they've been directed as to what sort of policies they develop rather than uh, under the previous administration, the Productivity Commission had more say over what it was going to investigate. But productivity is still a basic issue that we have not confronted in this country. So how do we go about lifting productivity? Well, I think uh, if you asked the Luxon and Hipkins what, why is productivity low in the country, they would give you all sorts of answers. Um, but I think the truth is they don't know why it's low. Mm. And I'm not going to appear a fancy pants and say I know the answer either. I want to be honest about it and say I don't know the, 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 that there is, you know, what the answer to that question is in one line. There's a one-line answer saying this is why productivity is low and we have to we have to fix it. So that that's a worry. It's been an issue, ongoing issue in the country for a long time. Some people think they know the answer. Um, I, I, they're about. 10 or 20 possible reasons. Uh, I remember when Key was Prime Minister, he used to go along to these meetings, and when this issue came up, he said, oh, it was our geographical isolation, because the Productivity Commission had mentioned that. And, of course, it was a great thing line for him to say, because there's nothing he could do about that. Yeah. Um, so that, that, that's underlying, that's the crack in national and labour, but also it's a fault probably in my own profession, um, even the pro very productivity c commission's uh, existence, you know, that was why they were set up to crack that problem. And, you know, if you read the Productivity Commission stuff, they'll, they've got so many possible reasons why, you know, we're a small country, um, mm. you know, so, in, you know, we're not on the scale of the United States, um, you know, there's too much market concentration in, in, in all these different issues. We don't have clusters, they say, like sort of Silicon Valley in the US, we're not big enough for that. Yeah. Um, but but the, the you know the answers go on and on. Yeah. You know, is there something wrong with our? Some people say, oh, it's the tax system, and people no. put too much money into real estate, and not in productive capital. But after all this debate, you're left with twenty or thirty reasons. But maybe and it is twenty or thirty reasons. That maybe we 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 need to get the productivity commission to be refocused because we've had a lot of mm. fundamental science, societal changes in the last three years. So we've had the working from home stuff. You know, and, mm. and I actually think that is that has actually had some massive impacts. You know, you look around, uh, you know, mm. Wellington. You know, when I was mm. here 10 years ago, um, mm. if you went down for a coffee or something in a cafe that was reasonably popular, you'd be lining up um, because mm. be, everyone would be in there at 7 o'clock doing stuff, having meetings mm. and talking. Uh, mm -hmm. I tell you what, they're like deserts. Deserts so are not mm -hmm. even opening till nine o'clock because there's God. no bugger and doubt on a Friday, uh, and, yes. and so there's a whole change of that. And the other thing is, is that quiet quitting, as they call it, which I think is a weird term. But mm. I'm a probably classic example. I don't like working full time anymore, and I have the choice to mm. do that. And people are making those choices now after the last three years of having a big mm. think about their lifestyles. So we've had a mm. change of people who could be fundamentally much more productive who simply just mm. don't want to work full time and so you mm. take them you're taking them and if you did it by hours or days out of the economy in terms of of you know full time units or FTEs or whatever you want to call them and, and that mm. has a huge impact mm. I, I, I concur with you on that. Um, I can't prove it, but my gut feeling 
as to what's going on in this country is if you look at these, uh, although these wellbeing surveys, life satisfaction, a lot of people laugh at them. I, I don't laugh at them. No. Uh, they rank all the countries in the world as, as on these self-reports of people on a scale of 1 to 10, how, saying, how satisfied they are with their life. And Kiwis remarkably rank in the top 10 in the world. Exactly. And we've done so for decades. It's got nothing to do with the Dern's wellbeing approach. Mm. Kiwis are reporting exceptionally high uh, overall life satisfaction before Ardern ever became Prime Minister. So that, that's been going on. And you get the sense that uh, traditionally Kiwis have liked the overall lifestyle here, the sort of work-life balance. Mm. And you wonder if even though their salaries are not quite as big, um, they've liked just the overall lifestyle and so the productivity you know it hasn't been uh you know in the silicon valley or new york or london where they're striving and in the office 12 hours a day they've yeah. given up sort of maybe being as productive as you could because the overall work-life balance and, and i wonder if it if there isn't some sort of cultural reason going on that that's what why we we kind of like it this way but exactly. then there's this tension that we're maybe not generating enough wealth to pay for you know a world-class health system and an education system mm. so it's mm. beginning there's a tension there that we all want our lifestyle but um we don't want to work to pay for it we don't want to work to pay for it that, that's the impression yeah we might have cracked yeah. that nut <laughs> well it could but if, if that is the truth that that opens a very serious issue for mm. the nats and labor it does because if that's what's going on how are they going to generate the wealth yeah it's a and yeah, yeah. Maybe Kiwis don't really want to, and then what are we sort of thinking? We'll get an immigrant to do the work, or you know, that could be a very, but that's a serious issue, isn't um, it? If that's the truth, yeah. yeah. And I think it is getting close to the truth. I can't. I, I all my friends are, who are over fifty, none of them are working full time. Admittedly, they come from policy backgrounds, or ma mm. even managers are not in the office five days a week anymore. Everyone can no. be more mobile. That helps some in some respects of delivery but it, it doesn't always help with productivity and as i said we're just working less and um, i'm not even too sure whether we've got the algorithms within the systems like trends data analysis to actually even understand the, the impact of that yet but someone needs to do that work that's right. They don't have the data. So that's, it could be, to be fair to everyone, the party leaders, the uh, academic think tanks working at the Productivity Commission, that's right. I, I'm suspicious there's not some issue like that, which is very hard to prove. It's very hard to get the data mm. on that sort of cultural shift or, as you say, the quiet quitting. It's hard to measure it and prove it, but yeah. uh, to the extent it's going on, that, that, that could be the reason. But then it does throw the election into a different light because you... You have the parties saying, "Look, I, 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 we're, you know, we're going to improve productivity, and we know how, and we'll cut some regulation in business or tweak the tax system in a particular way." Mm. Well, if what you're saying is the truth, that's not going to change anything. No, you know, that's right. th these kind of tweaks <laughs> to, you know, what the Nats call wasteful spending. Okay, you know, well, don't, don't build a, you know, particular town hall in the provinces somewhere, and you can cut that or something. Well, that's yeah. not going to change anything. No. That that you're, no. you know, it's not going to turn the dial. No. So that, that sort of casts it all in a different light. Yeah, it does. And, and I mean, and, and when you see it in a symptomatic sort of uh, spending or focus mm. on uh, policy and managers and not on frontline workers, um, which is some of that data that they have analysed out there. And, and it's very clear that the government's is um, puffing up the back end, but not, uh, not doing much around increasing the people who actually do make the world go around and make better. Well, um, there could be a shakeout looming that hasn't happened because in obviously uh, efficient big companies can't tolerate this kind of stuff. So you're seeing, for example, in Silicon Valley, these large scale layoffs now. Mm. So they're aware that people working at home at Google and Facebook, uh, you know, they hired a lot during the pandemic and they're, they're, they're being fired now. Well, you know, we're not observing so far in this country sort of mass layoffs to no. do with these efficiency issues, but that that could be coming. And if it's mm. not coming, we're gradually going to just uh, become a poorer country because we're, mm. we're not going to bite the bullet on that. That's right. Well, that was a big issue. That sort of came out of left field in a lot of ways. But, hey, look, it's been a fabulous discussion mm. uh, and yeah. um, very keen to talk to you again. And ho hopefully Sean mm. will have you back again at some point well, when somebody well. gets sick. <laughs>
Um, and, um, yeah, look, thank you very much, Robert. Hope you have a really yeah. uh, good weekend, and yeah. um, uh, thanks for the informative chat. Yeah, thanks for inviting me. Bye.